Namaskaram, Happy New Year. It is January 1st, 2021 and I am with my guest Sridhar Chityala Ji. Sridhar Ji, Namaskar and welcome to P Guru's Prime Time. Namaskaram and good morning to all and uh, Happy English New Year 2021 to all of you and uh, best wishes as we look forward and look ahead to get past uh, COVID-19. Viewers, this is a program which is going to look at the 2021 year, what it's going to mean to us and what are the different uh, strands that are at play. We are going to start straight with the US elections because there's much that is happening. The last couple of days it's been hectic amount of activity across the states. The president is back in the White House. So to know all about that, let's go over to Sridhar Ji. Sridhar Ji, what is really going on in the US elections as we come to hear now that for sure uh, some in the Senate and some in many in the Congress are going to object to the Electoral College result. Great. I think as they say, all roads lead to Rome and here all roads lead to Washington, D.C. Uh, the president uh, cut short his vacation and he arrived and he issued a press statement um, and uh, he addressed the American uh, people from the, uh, the, the tours of the White House basically outlaid all the accomplishments and what he has done and, uh, you know, the way forward. He also uh, galvanized his supporters and basically said, please come and uh, uh, support me on January 6th when the most important, uh, you know, electoral uh, vote counting takes place and the, the decisions are made. So there's more than already one to 1.25 million people expected to arrive in Washington, D.C. to reinforce the support. Adjacent to that, as you rightly pointed out, there's a series of activities that are going on. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Gomer's uh, litigation, uh, the Texan uh, uh, senator's litigation, that file, which is to say to grant M Mike Pence uh, the, the rights to uh, intervene because of the illegitimacy of the elections in the battleground states and call for a discussion and a voting to occur based on that. So that's the first trend. Uh, he, has, uh, he has had uh, discussions with the counsel of uh, Mike Pence and the legal team of Mike Pence, etc. Though they are not yet in agreement, that strand of activity is moving on. Depending on who you talk to, there's two sets of data. One set of data says, if you are a right-wing publication, there's now close to 120 combined senators and House representatives, total 120, now ready to stand up and raise objections uh, to the uh, to the state of issues that is enveloped the uh, battleground states, which has just been beaten down, um, notwithstanding the fact optically it looks like things are dismissed, but according to many, that is not the case. Um, but when you talk to the left, which is namely one uh, like New York Times or Bloomberg, their number seems to be around 42 to 49. Uh, that, again, is a significant number. Remember, we started with, uh, with uh, Mo Brooks, uh, then we went to Ron Johnson, uh, then we went to, uh, what's his name? Uh, I forget his name, uh, that name escapes my memory. Then we went to uh, Josh Hawley, uh, and then of course now a whole bunch of uh, senators who are uh, standing up and saying, we have a problem that needs to be discussed. By the way, in 2005, the Democrats did exactly the same thing and they wanted basically when this is the George Bush election, right? So 2005, they said the same thing, and they said they need a vote to be discussed in the uh, uh, in the House. That was uh, dismissed, but that's that's our Republicans are pointing out. Hey, do you remember 2005? Okay, so come down, and you know we'll deal with this. Well, um, there are also some other states that are uh, urging their senators and representatives to object to electoral votes, such as uh, the GOP in Tennessee state, sir. So yes, now, GOP, yeah, GOP in Tennessee have found out. Uh, sorry, I let I cut you off. Please finish your question, sir. Sorry, my apologies. I, I just wanted to know if you could uh, dwell upon that as well as uh, Pennsylvania lawmakers. So please go ahead, sir. Right. OK. I think Pennsylvania lawmakers, uh, as is very well known, that they could not get because the Supreme Court, uh, Pennsylvania Supreme Court judge was uh, un was unrelenting and he taken a... In fact, I don't know whether uh, it's like saying in a police and thief because the, uh, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, you know, passed laws 
which they're not supposed to, and that is the remit of the legislature for the conduct of the elections. They refuse to budge. Similarly, the Secretary of State is not supposed to certify. It is the state legislators. So there's a lot of things that went under the bridge in uh, Pennsylvania. So the Pennsylvania lawmakers have been the most active. And then, of course, the Texas people stepped in after. So Pennsylvania lawmakers are saying this whole thing is illegitimate. Now, the number started from 289. Now, now the, the number has gone to 1.2 million votes potentially cast, and especially those that came after the cutoff date. Uh, and there's also a lot of deduplication that needs to be done. So that issue is from Pennsylvania. As far as the Tennessee is concerned, Tennessee is stating not only in their own specific kind of state they have observed something, but they support the decisions taken based on the evidence that they have seen in the other, other states, including the briefings that took place in the state legislatures. Lo and behold, Tennessee became the epicenter of action with this RV vehicle going off and, uh, you know, a major blast at the at and uh, with the at and building being, you know, parts of the at and being built, uh, that at and center being destroyed and telecommunication services interrupted. So you have uh, the Tennessee coming up. I also want to state, but I don't know whether this is a follow-on question. If it is not, then I'll just wait and listen. I just wanted to say Arizona, in Arizona, the people, the people of Arizona have gone around and looked at, they believe close to about 30% of the votes is what they call phantom. So in other words, there is no person, but they have names and addresses that is not in the rolls. So how they made it to the list, it don't know. That is the latest breaking news where the people in Arizona have taken ownership of the issue after listening to all the briefings that took place. Sir, um, we have a couple more issues and I'm going to prompt you one by one. One is the fact that uh, Senator Hawley, Hawley of uh, Missouri, he said that uh, he will reject Biden's election on January 6th. Because if you notice, see, there is a fair amount of confusion in the minds of people. They don't seem to be able to figure out who is doing what. For example, uh, you had Mitch McConnell uh, opposing Trump. Then he comes up with his own version of the bill, which sides with Trump, and he goes and uh, every line item of Trump, he says yes. So while McConnell and some senators and some uh, congressmen from Republican were saying no to the 2,000 per head uh, handout, the Democrats are enthusiastically in favor of it. So what I'm trying to say is shifting positions on various things here. And, and, and people are a little confused who is with whom. So I'm hoping that by the time January 6th comes along, that there is better clarity. And I think all these people, the McConnells of the world, the uh, Bernie Sanders of the world, they, need, they owe the country an explanation as to how they keep taking these stands and then why do they change it and what prompts them to make these kinds of change. After all, these are senators, these are congressmen, they have, you know, they have responsibility to the nation. This is just my rant, sir. Let's go to the next point. We have the Dominion CEO saying that the voting machines were never connected to the internet. And now it has been proven to be a lie, isn't it? Can you throw a little bit more light on that, sir? Well, I think the two people, one is the forensic evidence that was, con that was independently, con uh, independently conducted, proved that the machines were connected to the Internet. So effectively, he has lied under oath. In a, in a, uh, in a, when a state legislature calls for an inquiry, and he is supposed to come and do the briefing, then it's apart, 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 uh, it's according, you know, he has to swear by oath, take an oath, and then basically, so effectively, the message that is coming out is is, is effectively light. There's, there are two states that are pointing out that the um, the uh, the voting machines were connected to the, clearly Georgia is one, the, potentially there is also Michigan, uh, which is connected, which was also kind of connected to the, um, connected to the um, uh, internet. But clearly, the one that is uh, that is popping up is um, uh, is uh, uh, Georgia. Now, uh, Georgia, because there is a Senate election coming up in a couple of days. In fact, uh, mail-in votes are already enabled for the past, uh, I think, couple of weeks now. Um, it, it's it's going to be very interesting. What is going to happen there? 
how can one be sure that the elections this time around there are going to be free and fair of any kind of malpractice? Well, there is the, uh, uh, not Sydney, uh, uh, the other lawyer. Linwood? Uh, yes, sorry, Linwood. Thank you. Thank you. Linwood has filed a case that in lieu of lack of changes, in lieu of the secretary of Georgia, uh, Raffelsberger, especially after these water ballots, voter address changes was turned down by a Supreme uh, by a high court judge, local district high court, uh, the uh, state judge, who happens to be the sister of Stacey Abrams from the Democratic Party, who is a Obama appointee. That doesn't mean that she is biased, but obviously she has taken a position that it is okay. That's one is okay. And the second one is, the second issue around in Georgia is that there's drop, ball, drop boxes to be kept open 24 hours, which is not very easy to guard. They said, you know, it has to be limited. So these basically, uh, so um, Linwood has stated the state elections should be deferred until the electoral process has been agreed to and any deficiencies such as this deduplication process, the validity of the voting machines, the integrity of the conduct of the elections, especially whether it is open to internet, not internet, the counting process, which was also subject to a lot of controversy in Georgia, is addressed. Uh, the runoff elections, which is critical to the future of the United States, has to be deferred. That's the case. Now, um, should uh, I'm sure people are thinking about this. Should the judge not have recused herself from making a, a ruling on this particular case since she is known to be the sister of uh, uh, Stacey Abrams? And, and she's a very famous person. I mean, if you are in the United States, if you happen to watch TV, you can see her face at least four or five times a day. So it's not something like, you know, as an obscure person. No, Stacey Abrams is in your face asking for money all the time. Anyway, this is just my observation, sir, and uh, anyone well, who wants to... Uh, it's a very good point that you raised, because they did ask her to recluse, but she she refused. <laughs> See, the truth is coming out by way of this question and answer session here. And uh, so, viewers, you have to understand that this is an election that is not one fair and square. And this is going to be hanging over Biden's head, Kamala Harris's head. By the way, sir, has she resigned her Senate seat? Yes, she has. Okay. So that, they have uh, not, I think we covered this in one. I, I think it's Padilla or someone. One oh, of the Jose people. Padilla is now the new uh, person. Right, right, right. Okay, good, good. So at least that is out of the way. And uh, the next question or next observation that I have, sir, is the uh, the... Democrats' contempt for military votes is visible in swing states that almost 93% of the votes were stolen and allotted to Biden. I mean, this is, this is bizarre. How did someone make this connection, sir? Well, I think there are independent people-based investigations are going on. Now, many of the data can, you know, if you're a Democrat, right, let's assume that we have to see that position. There will be quite a few Democrats in the P Guru's audience who would be refuting each of this, you know, to say, what are these two guys, Sri and Sri, talking about? And, you know, making all these kinds of stuff, you know, we have won the election, won the election, won the election. All this is nonsense, and this is coming from the right-wing side. You know, such a statement would come. The facts are, whether it is right-wing or left-wing, the facts are that there is an issue that is put on the table. If you want to, if you want to contain this, contain this with facts. I always tell the Democrats, for... 12 months, knowing the truth, Bill Clinton took this country through a process with dogmatic determination by the Democrats to stand by, but knowing the truth. Even the final concession, he went on to say, it is, not it is, not it is. He went on to make this statement. So therefore, there is always this suspicion on either side of the fence, right, which is to say, when you guys dragged on for the thing that, you know, we are stating facts here. If you want to disapprove, disapprove it. 
Okay, but don't kind of be dismissive because the election is contentious. So this 93 percent, which has been, um, you know, the military votes, which has been assessed by uh, the whole bunch of people, and it's across, you know, all these, many of these things are in, you know, embedded. Nevada is one. Pennsylvania is one. These are all the army states. They find that these votes may have been allocated. Now, mind you, there's two sets of, there's a Navarro investigation that has happened. There is independent state investigation that has happened. Then there is the Josh Lott uh, investigation that has happened. So there's a whole series of investigations. And then there is the legal, uh, the, the Trump team uh, legal investigation. Then Sidney Powell's team investigation that has happened. So there's a whole set of activity that has happened, right? So the people who know the truth know the truth. The people who don't know the truth have to discover it and make a case unless and until it is proven, it remains what it is on either side. So this 93 percent is a very compelling number. This is one of the things that is also pointed out uh, in that Lord's report. So now let us take a quick look at uh, the markets of 2021. In particular, I wanted you to touch upon the spectacular performance of Bitcoin in uh, 2020. Uh, how do you uh, explain this rise, sir? Bitcoin is, after all, a series of digits and numbers, and, and somebody must be there as a counterparty to be buying up this stuff. And I just can't imagine why somebody would want to buy this Bitcoin at $20,000. Well, look, I'm in markets. I'm deep in markets. I'm not going to give all the secrets away in the show. OK, uh, so therefore, I'll give you a very generic answer, which is to state that there was a lot of institutional interest, institutional interest in buying, uh, especially in the last uh, you know, few months, uh, you know, the institutional invest began to grow. And so there's many institutional investors who have come in and taken position. Number one. Number two, um, the China, uh, China global, China United States trade remains a kind of a big, uh, uh, you know, a, a big issue and big contentious point, right? So always when you have, then you go for a hedge. That's number two. Number three, those who are playing in the interest rate markets, you know, subtly we have been covering every day we put up, why we put up a 10-year bond and why we put up a 30-year bond rate. So there's a method behind the madness as to why we put the numbers. So if you can understand those numbers, those numbers have been coming down quite steadily. So you need an alternate venue uh, and what's the venue? Historically, oil and gold. You look at the oil, again, every day we put up that number. So the story is, and every day, we have started to put to some extent the gold number, though we put the crude, we put the rates, and we put the Bitcoin, right? So that gives you some indication, this, this bits and pieces of numbers that you call a suddenly attracted interest, not as a currency, but as a hedge commodity, potentially, to play around to find alternative venues to deploy capital. That's how I kind of see it. Also, in the event of a major catastrophe, you need something that is not linked to dollar, which is depreciating, not linked to renminbi, and not linked to EU. There's no other currency. These are the only three. I'm not counting yen here because this yen, yen has not, not enough depth uh, for it to cover. Well, if only India had made its currency uh, completely, uh, what do you call that thing? Uh, a delisted. Uh, a delisted, delisted. A, a complete, allowed it to float in the market, uh, then that would be a compelling uh, currency at this point of time. Because people would say, for the exact reasons that you mentioned, the money that is chasing bitcoins could be bu buying up rupees because India is seen as a growth spot. And, and we, we in India, we don't want to make our uh, currency float. And we just keep this uh, nonsensical thing called weights and put, put your currency against that. Nobody will tell you what is a weightage. People will be quietly changing the weights. And, and all we know is that, lo and behold, it's 73 rupees to a dollar. Can anyone explain why? No. And, and anyway, I'll, I can go on this rant for a long time. This is the point here is that this money that is going into Bitcoin could have been going into India. For that, India has to do nothing but let their currency float. Of course, there are a lot of people in the finance ministry, allegedly, who have taken positions against a falling rupee, which will hurt them. Come on now. We're, they are supposed to set down the laws, not play the market. Anyway, this is just my allegation. I could be wrong. Um, 
Let's take a quick look at the markets in general. How do you see markets uh, reacting in 2021? Certainly the markets had a great year last year. How, how do things appear this year, sir? Well, I think there are two answers to that question. One answer to the question is what I call as the uh, Biden headwinds or Trump's uh, tailwinds, depending on which one. The markets are expected to do quite well on the back of uh, a 5% growth in the GDP. We have not seen 5% growth in GDP for a long time. The Fed forecast is 4.2% GDP, whereas the, uh, the uh, Goldman Sachs re-amended it uh, to 5%. And 5% is very much kind of re uh, reflective because $900 billion went in. Right. When Fed projected it was, you know, it had not had that nine hundred. but he expected some stimulus. But it's on the back of one hundred and twenty billion dollars per month of the the purchases that they had uh, agreed to, which is extra one point four trillion, four, four trillion dollars of liquidity available to uh, mid corporates and large corporates uh, via the, the Fed window uh, through that through their banking system. So I expect if the policies continue, uh, the present policies of uh, Trump continue, which will not be the case under the Biden, then I expect the uh, the markets to do well. Uh, the general prediction in the markets is that, you know, it's expected to be about 9 to 9 to 11% growth in the markets. We may see again another uh, stellar S&P performance. Uh, you know, we, we touch 29%, we won't touch 29%. Uh, in, in what we did in 2019. We touched 16.3% with the S&P growing again uh, and on the last day of the trading on December 31st. So I expect S&P to be around that, you know, uh, 12 to 15% growth uh, because the reason is a lot of the growth has already occurred and most of the growth came from, you know, about 10 companies and, you know, or 10 uh, institutions. The tech companies, the biotech companies, pharma companies, and semiconductor companies, you know, these are the guys who drove uh, the, the market. Your famous NVIDIA is in one of those uh, 10, uh, 10 companies that drove the, not only the market cap, but also the valuation uh, in the S&P numbers. Let me ask you a hypothetical question, sir. F-A-A-N-G, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. These are the ones that are weighted heavily in S&P. Some of them are also in the Dow. Some of them are also in the NASDAQ. And all these things are looking really good because of these and per perhaps plus NVIDIA and a few uh, uh, bio companies. Now, Section 230, if that were to go, wouldn't these stocks take a beating? No. The answer is no. Because one is political the other is economic. The revenue of Facebook and Google comes from advertising. Actually, elimination of Section 230 may really help them uh, to, to accelerate the ad revenue because quite a few of the ad revenues, when this political interference came, came in, they stood out. They may go back in. Uh, go back in. And rem remember this, ad, ad goes in when on the supply side, supply side there's liquidity available. Ad revenue goes in when on the demand side there is consumption. The demand side, the consumption is driven by the stimulus that is going into the hands and pockets of the people. On the supply side, the liquidity is available. The Fed is saying, I'm keeping the interest rates zero. The cost of your borrowing in the market is not more than 1.25%. Just to give you the numbers, the interest rates in 2020, the 10-year interest rates dipped from 1.7% to 0.7%. We tracked this and we also tracked 0.9%, to 0.9%, right? 0.93%. So the interest rates, the cost of borrowing to the corporations is less. Second, there is also the Fed window that has been opened. Plus, there is also for the small businesses, $325 billion of cash that is being infused to support the small businesses. Both the small businesses and medium corporates are large advertisers in the internet medium because they don't have direct channels to drive traffic for their consumption. So this is the reason why yeah, Facebook, 
or a, for example, an alphabet will continue to show. That's one part of it on the Facebook side. Alphabet is also because they continued need for their infrastructure that is used by a number of people. More and more digital and online consumption implies that the need for their infrastructure and services, which is what is driving Amazon and Microsoft, will show demonstrative kind of growth. Now, is the growth going to be as big as what we saw in 2019? No, much of it is kind of you know, built in. What also people don't recognize is most of these companies receive revenue upfront and they amortize the revenue over a period of time, unlike other businesses where you provide the service and then you collect the money. That's <coughs> Thank you, sir. <coughs> That's fascinating. Uh, so so you, the intended purpose and, and the outcome are going to be actually opposite in your view, and let's see how this thing plays out. Okay. But intended <coughs> purpose is to make them stay away from politics leveraging their reach. That is the intended purpose. Their intended purpose is not to hurt their economics. What the government is saying is, we have given you the free reign on economics, you are abusing it. You are taking that money, and rather than investing in the need, for example, we pointed out two shows ago, the tech companies were far ahead in dealing with COVID, but they did not carry the rest of the economy forward in the way they, in the way by which they manage their people and the COVID program. They were quite exemplar. That best practices they did not advocate and socialize it across the ecosystem is the complaint that is being made by markets, not even by the government. So I think we need to kind of insulate between what the government is saying from a political interference point of view, rather than their economic outcome. They're not saying, you know, don't kind of, you know, they are one of the largest buyers. They're buyers of Amazon, they are buyers of Microsoft, they're even buyers of Google in terms of the interest. So it's not about that. So we should not combine the two pieces, right? The political piece and the economic piece, two different things. This is the beauty of the US system. Sir, so I am the Dr. Watson to your, the, your uh, Sherlock Holmes. So I'm glad uh, this, uh, exchange of views is happening here. Finally, you segued into this in your uh, observation, COVID. Where do things stand as far as COVID is concerned? In your opinion, how do you think mastery or control over this is going to be achieved by the world? And, uh, you know, India has certainly got the potential to be the manufacturing powerhouse for COVID vaccines as well as uh, things like hydrochloroquine. So, uh, would this be India's year, 2021? Uh, India, it is India's year. Uh, you know, it has been India's year since I think I would say 2015. Uh, the resurgence of India began at that point of time. Uh, the opening up of the markets, as well as the way the balance sheet is being kind of managed. I I hope they can do a better job. But we'll discuss that when we do the India curtain raiser with other experts. Uh, the, the the point that uh, that as far as COVID situation is concerned, United States, to get back to your question, you know, we have rising cases. OK, I'm just you know, I can't remember all numbers uh, my, by my head. Um, the COVID situation is we have 20.45 million uh, people who are impacted by uh, by by COVID. Uh, there's been 345,000 deaths and 12.1. Uh, so and the deaths are, are slowing down, but yet 354,000 deaths is a big number. There's still 8 million people active. Now, the vaccine vaccination program is active. As at midnight, 1% of US population, which is about roughly 3.17 million people have been vaccinated and 26% of doses have been sent to the states. Mr. F Dr. Fauci made a profound statement today, which is effectively to state that uh, the program is not going at a faster pace than what we thought, basically because the local and the state governments, uh, you know, have not, uh, don't have the resources and hence caused by the delays. Uh, that's one part of it. The second, so in other words, the stimulus, which if it gets approved, sorry, the first stimulus, 900 billion, takes care of that. There's about 82 billion allocated in that specific number, if you recall. That that includes for testing as well as the programs. So that money will slowly kind of begin to reach out and uh, the thing goes. Now, I just want to make one specific observation here. I had a doctor from California, uh, you know, who took the, uh, whom both of us know, you know, took the vaccine. 
uh, and he sent me a message to say, ah, I've taken the vaccine, $101,000, uh, you know, is, is done. Well, my injection cost the U.S. government $101,000. That's what it cost that person to take one injection. On the contrary, when you look at the Serum Institute of, um, of, uh, of India, they're saying they're going to send a re their vaccine the retail price of a vaccine, which will be available in the market for anybody to go and buy that and take it, is between six and seven dollars. Okay, so we have a problem in the United States, and that's called our healthcare system. Our healthcare system is so prohibitively expensive, the cost of medication and the cost of treating people is humongous. That is why Russia says. I will go to India and get my Sputniks manufactured in India. I will go, Germany says, the same BioNTech. I'll go to G India, get that manufactured and bring it back. AstraZeneca Oxford partnership, they're going to. So the question that is therefore open is, can you be a disruptive to take your own industry to, and to leverage? There is this emotive and sentimental issue that then pops up. Hey, we did this and we lost all of our pants and shirts when we went to China. We lost all of our manufacturing and we have nothing left. So there is this emotive decision. So the question that is propped up or that opens up is, you know, what is that going to be? You know, hydroxychloroquine, you mentioned hydroxychloroquine is what? It was 75 cents or one dollar. You know, the retail here is, you know, is, is more than that. Now, could that have helped? The answer is, you know, I'm not a doctor, but people tell me that could have helped, right? So the story is that as far as the COVID is concerned, we have an issue around the healthcare system. As far as the program is concerned, as we roll, as we look ahead in terms of 2020, this is one of the other headwinds that United States, in fact, it's the top head, political headwind is the number one, COVID headwind is number two, Whatever is the economic measures that are going to be put in place. So in other words, Biden said he's going to borrow four more trillion dollars or he's going to impose five more trillion dollars on high income taxes. Never in the world taxing an economy has allowed economy to grow. Only when you cut taxes, you have seen economy to kind of grow. So therefore, on the economic side, whatever happens on the political, if there's new taxes and if there is new stimulus, that means you're doing both. That means you're squeezing the person on the other side. I told you both on the demand side and the supply side, if you don't manage that properly, you're going to have an economic kind of outlier that is going to be an impediment. So similarly in the COVID situation, they're going to need more money to vaccinate the rest of the nation to cover the full 300 million people. And you have to overcome, we have not seen all the side effects that flow on from these vaccines, how the emotive issue of that and how the treatment of that needs to occur over that period of time. The local and state governments are a fundamental kind of pivots in making this happen. Is this going to be political again between the red states and the blue states? because I have a blue state president or I have a red state president, so I'm going to oppose whatever the, the guy at the other, other end says. So these are things that the United States will grapple as we try to get out of the COVID situation. Thank you very much, uh, Sridharji. And uh, we come to an end of our program today. Please like, subscribe our program, watch it till the end because we are trying to provide you with some very useful information. And, and viewers, here's the request. Do not use profanity or expletive ridden comments. We will be forced to delete them because uh, uh, channels like YouTube and Facebook do not encourage and we get penalized for your observation and your observation should be on the facts of what we are revealing, not on some uh, uh, comments that are just essentially blather and uh, uh, of a personal nature. So please don't do that. And also, uh, viewers, we'll be back again on Monday the 3rd at 5 a.m. Pacific, 8 a.m. Eastern and 6.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time. Thank you once again, uh, Sridharji, and Namaskar, and we'll be back. See you soon. Thank you, Ji. Thank you.